Uh, my name is Robert Dijkraaf, Director of the Institute for Advanced Study, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this, I think, exceptional event, celebrating Freeman Dyson's Maker of Patterns and Art Biography through letters. It's also the first day of spring, I feel, very appropriate. <laughs> it's something that Freeman is able to uh, control. And also, I, of course, want to uh, welcome you all, but in particular also the uh, board members of AMIAS, which is our association of uh, former members of the Institute for Advanced Study. They have their uh, semi-annual board meeting here, and so great pleasure to have them here, including President Kristen. Terrific. Thank you for, for being here. And, of course, a warm welcome to, to Freeman. We'll see you a lot, but also to Ine. I think it's great uh, to have to both of you here. Uh, in 1940, a 19-year-old mathematics community college, Cambridge, time receives an envelope and as he writes to his parents I was agreeably surprised on Thursday to receive a large envelope stamped Princeton February 11 1943 and inside lo and behold was the consistency of the continuum hypothesis by Kurt Gödel this is the first time I've ever been aware except from an abstract point of view that a place called America really exists <laughs> Young Freeman seemed not to be prone to much self-doubt. He goes on, I have been reading the immortal work, it's only a 60 pages long, together with the magic mountain, and I find it hard to say which is better. <laughs> so Gödel, Thomas Mann, 1-1 one, one is the score, I guess. <laughs> so this message from a bottle was the beginning of a lifelong relationship of Freeman with Princeton and the Institute. Of course, he came here first in person in 1948, this summer 70 years ago, as part of an exceptional group of eight young physicists and mathematicians to work with Robert Oppenheimer. And he been a, has been a faculty member since uh, 1953. Freeman, I think you could never dreamt how much your life, uh, personal and professional, would have been entangled with the Institute when you first opened that envelope. <laughs> um, it's hard to capture Freeman, I won't try to. I know in Japan, they have an exceptional category for very valuable Japanese, which are called living treasures. So I think that actually would be the appropriate terminology. Of course, trained as a mathematician, actually a number theorist, got great fame as a theoretical physicist, building the foundations of modern particle physics. Then Freeman moved in building and designing nuclear reactors, space travel, astronomy, astrobiology, disarmament, climate change. He was an all-around futurist and humanitarian and all the time in his own words, as these letters attest to, a wise observer of the human scene. He's also a lifelong contrarian, a rebel in his own words. Uh, Freeman's orthogonal to any preconceived ideas, including his own. <laughs> uh, his father is the eminent uh, British composer, Sir George Dyson, we learned was actually also the first one to write a treatise on throwing hand grenades, which was, I think, a very appropriate metaphor. <laughs> and now we have a local theorem, folk theorem, that if you want Freeman to agree with you, you surround him with people who disagree with you. <laughs> but I'll be very brief. We are here to celebrate the publishing of this wonderful autobiography. The program is extremely simple. Freeman will read to you some excerpts and then I will have the immense pleasure to interview him, and so will you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for coming. So I'll read about 15 minutes worth of letters, and then we'll have the conversation. So this is arriving at Princeton the first time. A short ride from Philadelphia across rolling downs and meadows, brought us finally to Princeton, which is a pleasant little old town, entirely supported by the university and not in the least American looking. <laughs> the university is a large collection of buildings built in a solid Gothic style in imitation of Oxford and Cambridge. The institute is a small building in the country, about a mile from the university, built in an unpretentious and utilitarian red brick. The pleasant surprise is that it is small and intimate. 
a good deal smaller than the physics building at Cornell, where I had been previously. The institute is beautifully decorated and furnished. There is a lounge with the Times Air edition and every other important newspaper and periodical, an excellent library, a tea room, and private workrooms. I glowed with respective glory, with respected glory, as I walked past the doors bearing the names of Einstein, Weil, von Neumann, and Gödel. I have been given a beautiful mahogany table in a beautifully carpeted room next door to Oppenheimer, where his young physicists are put to be near him and one another. I have not yet met my colleagues. When I visited the Institute, there were more children there than grown-ups. <laughs> Dirac, with his two girls, shortly living for England, and various other children playing cowboys and England and Indians, and von Neumann looking rather vague in the midst of the confusion. If I don't do well here, it won't be the Institute's fault. Oppenheimer will not be here for about a month. At the moment, he, he, with most of the other important people, is in England conferring with Canadian and British scientists on the subject of secrecy. The conference was held, according to the announcement, in view of recent technical developments in atomic energy. One may speculate as to whether this may mean A, progress in achieving uranium power plants, or B, progress in achieving super bomb explosions. In the first case, one would expect some loosening of secrecy. In the second case, some tightening. We shall see. Tomorrow will be exactly a year since I landed in America. Who would have dreamed that I should be coming to Princeton with the thought not of learning, but of teaching Oppenheimer about physics. <laughs> I had better be careful. <laughs> September 26, that's just two weeks later, Yukawa has turned up. He was the, the leading physicist in Japan who had got a Nobel Prize for the prediction of the meson. He is most friendly and approachable. We're hoping to get him to talk to a seminar before long. Besides him, there are a few eminent people, but a lot of good young ones. They're all struggling to understand the Schwinger radiation theory, which was at that point the, the, the latest thing in particle physics. I have not told them that I am struggling to supersede it. That would be bad manners. <laughs> I'm planning to publish my bombshell as soon as possible, preferably before Oppenheimer comes to pull it to pieces. And meanwhile, I say as little as possible. So Oppenheimer arrives. This is October 16, 1948, so it's a month later. Oppenheimer is unreceptive to the new ideas in general, and in particular to Feynman, who was the young rival to Schwinger. Oppenheimer shocked me when he arrived by taking a defeatist attitude to the whole business and showing complete lack of enthusiasm for a lot of the things I consider most hopeful. It is this general attitude of hesitation, which I now see I shall have to fight in the next few weeks. I'm sure I shall have no difficulty in the long run. And the great thing at present is to avoid antagonizing people by being impatient. In the afternoons, I've managed to explore the country around here. It is excellent walking country, and I've met numbers of strange new birds insects, and plants. On Sunday, I felt so irritable that I wrote a letter to Oppenheimer. So my remarks about teaching Oppenheimer some physics came true. 
On Sunday night, I went for a walk into a field outside the town where the sky was unobscured by lights. I sat down on the grass to make up my mind whether, to, whether I should send the letter off. After some time, I decided yes. And then suddenly the sky was filled with the most brilliant northern lights I've ever seen. They lasted only about five minutes, but were a rich blood red and, and filled half the sky. Whether the show really was staged for my benefit, I doubt. But certainly it produced the same psychological effect as if it had been. I sent the letter off. So then I gave a series of talks. The day after the last of my talks, I found in my mailbox a little handwritten note saying, Nolo contendere, R-O. That is the Latin phrase used by, by lawyers to say that they do not dispute an opinion. That was Oppenheimer's formal notice of surrender. Next week, we shall be in, all in New York at the annual Physical Society meeting. This is now January 1949. Oppenheimer will give a half-hour talk reviewing the state of physics, which he should do very well if he's up to his usual form. He is particularly good at defining problems when, when a subject is in a confused state. A good example of his style of presentation occurred the other day at lunch. I unexpectedly asked him whether he would advise me to choose Birmingham, Bristol, or Cambridge as my next home in England. He replied without a moment's hesitation, well, Birmingham has much the best theoretical physicist to work with, Piles. Bristol has much the best experimental physicist, Powell. Cambridge has some excellent architecture. <laughs> You can take your choice. <laughs> I made up my mind for Birmingham and wrote a letter to Piles accepting his offer of a fellowship. So then we skip 16 years or thereabouts. No, I, 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 I have a little piece about Cecile Moret and Richard Feynman, which I didn't want to skip. I decided, this, so this is back 19, 
October 1948. I decided that I needed a long weekend away from Princeton. I persuaded Cecile Moret, who was one of the postdocs who came the same time I did. Uh, uh, she was by far the best of the postdocs. I persuaded Sir Cecile Moret to come with me to, to see Feynman at Ithaca. This was a bold step on my part, but it could not have been more successful, and the weekend was deliriously happy. Feynman himself came to meet us at the station after our 10-hour train journey and was in tremendous form, bubbling over with ideas and stories, entertaining us with performances on Indian drums from New Mexico until one in the morning. Cecile Moret was the brightest of the young physicists who arrived at the Institute at the same time. She was the only one who quickly grasped the new ideas of Feynman. We immediately became friends. The fact that she happened to be female was irrelevant to our friendship. She was a natural leader. She understood modern mathematics better than I did, and she had a great sense of humor. The next day, Saturday, we spent discussing physics. Feynman gave a masterly account of his theory, which kept Cecile in fits of laughter and made my talk at Princeton a pale shadow by comparison. He said he had, been, he had given his copy of my paper to a graduate student to read, then asked the student if he himself ought to read it. The student said no, and Feynman accordingly wasted no time on it and continued chasing his own ideas. Feynman and I really understand each other. I know he is the one person in the world who has nothing to learn from what I have written, and he doesn't mind telling me so. <laughs> that afternoon, Feynman produced more brilliant ideas per square minute than I've ever seen anywhere before or since. In the evening, I mentioned that there were just two problems for which the finiteness of the theory remained to be proved, both problems are well known and feared by physicists. Many long and difficult papers running to 50 pages have been written about them, trying unsuccessfully to make the old theory give sensible results. When I mentioned this fact, Feynman said, we'll see about this, and proceeded to sit down. In two hours before our eyes obtained finite and sensible answers to both problems. It was the most amazing piece of calculation I've ever witnessed. The results prove, apart from unforeseen complications, the consistency of the whole theory. Those two problems were the scattering of light by an electric field and the scattering of light by light. After supper, Feynman was working until 3 a.m. He had a complete summer of vacation and returned with unbelievable stores of energy. On Sunday, Feynman was up at his usual hour, and we went down to the physics building, where he gave me another two-hour lecture of miscellaneous discoveries. Meanwhile, Cecile was at mass, being a strict Catholic. At 12 on the, Monday, on the Sunday, we started our journey home, arriving finally at two in the morning and thoroughly refreshed. Cecile assured me she had enjoyed it as much as I had. I found a surprising intensity of feeling for Ithaca, its breezy open spaces and hills, and its informal society. It seems like a place which I belong to, full of nostalgic memories. I suppose it really is my spiritual home, and in a way it still is. So then I, then, uh, now I skip to the Final scenes. Yesterday came the worst bombshell. This is February 17, 1966. Oppenheimer has a throat cancer and is in New York having radiation treatment. The doctors say it's a superficial thing, discovered early and with a good chance of being cured. I don't know how much of that to believe. Then the next day, last Sunday, Kitty Oppenheimer telephoned, very distraught, saying she did not believe the doctors were telling her the truth, asking me whether I could find somebody who would. I thought at once of Trudy Szilard, our friend in La Jolla, 
whose husband, Leo Szilard, had a cancer of the bladder, which was completely cured with radiation. He, he actually prescribed his own radiation treatment. <laughs> he was the, uh, Szilard was a great character too, who I don't have time to read about. He plays a big part in the story. He was the one who actually originally thought of atomic bombs. Szilard is a medical doctor, and having lived through this crisis with, with Leo, she knows everything there is to be known about it. I telephoned Trudy's sister in New York and was delighted to hear Trudy herself answer. Trudy is now in New York and easily accessible. I gave her number to Kitty and Oppenheimer tells me they had an hour's conversation which did Kitty enormous good. So March, March the 30th, 1966. I'm now finding out how lonely the Oppenheimers really are in spite of their huge number of friends. I feel oddly more sad leaving them for two weeks than leaving Emma and the children. These are the last two weeks of Robert's radiation treatment and in this time he must know whether it is life or, or death. I have been over three times to, 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 to their home to talk with Robert and Kitty. Kitty believes, perhaps rightly, that I, I could help Robert to keep alive by keeping alive his interest in physics. She feels desperately that he needs to be convinced that he is still needed in the community of physicists. On the other hand, I find that Robert is so physically tired from the radiation that my instinct is to hold his hand in silence rather than to burden him with part particles and equations. It is odd that I feel so personally responsible for him. I never had been close to him until now. I suppose it is partly the heredity that runs in our family that makes me want to save souls. Then is my final comment. My mother's mother, Eleanor Atkey, was a famous faith, faith healer, and my mother inherited some of her skill. Our daughter, Mia, who is a Presbyterian minister, has it too. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Freeman, and thank you for willing to engage in this conversation, and I guess it's director's privilege that I can ask a few questions first. Uh, you, you write in the book that the idea of writing in biography, autobiography in terms of letters, you kind of learned from Jim Watson. That's correct. Uh, how is it for you to be in conversation with your younger self? One thing that struck me, and I think many of the readers, that your style seems to be very consistent. You're a 17 year old. <laughs> Is, uh, is, is the kind of same kind of careful observer, as I would say, in you, as you are presently. How, how does it feel to be in conversation with yourself? Yes, that's fortunate, so that I, I, I haven't <coughs> talked, uh, lost the, 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 the reality of the old memories. No, I don't know why that's true, but it certainly is. Uh, it's, it's, it, I suppose it's because I started writing regularly, of course, as a teenager long before this began. But you wrote to your parents, to your sister. Uh, did you in any way have a gen more general audience in mind when you were writing? These no. no. Of course, there are a lot more letters which you didn't get into the book. But yeah. you, you say somehow that the great thing is of these letters is that you write about the situation with how, without the benefit of hindsight. Right. Um, can you say something about that element? Yes, because if you read what people wrote, I mean, this is particularly true of politicians, of course, but also <laughs> of scientists, that you read what they wrote 30 years later when they were aging, they write what they remember. It's very different from the truth. <laughs> 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 Your memories automatically mold themselves as time goes on. 
to make yourself look good. And, and you can't help that. It had happens to everybody, including me. So, <laughs> so I frequently find that the real truth is in the letter, which is written within a few days after the event. And the memory actually looks quite different, but I know that the one is true and the other is false. <laughs> you started by reading some very beautiful passages about your life here at the Institute, but I want to briefly go to the beginning of the book you write about your life in wartime Cambridge and London. Yes. And you say something that, you know, in some sense, it's remarkable how little uh, presence the war has in these letters. You, you mentioned from her saying of your father <laughs> that, you know, behaving half decent <laughs> and concentrating on music, or in your case, mathematics, was some way to counter whatever was happening. That's true. My father ran the conservatory in London, the Royal College of Music, and of course, uh, he was very determined to keep it open during the war, although the trustees wanted to close it, and they were afraid of getting bombed. And uh, my father put his bed into the office in the building and said he was going to sleep here every night and as long as there was a roof over his head. And that was his attitude. That in fact, the best way to defy Hitler was to pretend that Hitler didn't exist and carry on with doing music. And, and so it was true in Cambridge where I was, the same spirit that prevailed that we went on doing mathematics just to show Hitler that there were some things he couldn't touch. If you, uh, you describe about coming to America, which you know, in some sense was uh, ec incredibly welcoming to you. I mean, it's kind of amazing to see how soon you uh, entered, so to say, the inner circle of it the most leading, all the leading physicists and, and scientists. Can you s tell us something about your first impressions when you landed here? Yes, it was astonishing how little surprised me when I came to America. Partly it was because of <laughs> Alistair Cook. Alistair yes. Cook had come to America exactly as I did with the Commonwealth Fellowship, and he spent the rest of his life broadcasting. He worked for the BBC about America, so he lived in America, and but broadcast weekly to England a description of how things were in America. And when I arrived, I found it, it was all completely familiar to me because I'd been listening <laughs> to Alistair Cook for... <laughs> you studied the theory first. <laughs> but you, somehow well, you it was actually, of course, tremendous luck that I came to Cornell first. Because it happened in, uh, just in the spring of 1947, which so one year before I came to the Institute, I, I arrived at Cornell precisely at the right time, at the, at the right place. It happened there was Henry, uh, Hans Peter, who was officially my advisor, who was a great physicist in his own right, and also Richard Feynman, whom I'd not even heard of, who was a, a, a young professor uh, happened to be there too. And, and so those were the two people who actually were at the middle of starting the new era of particle physics. The, the, the big problem at that time was an experiment called the Lamb Shift, which was done by Willis Lamb at Columbia. But uh, to explain the Lamb Shift was so not the number one problem of physics. And Beta was the one who solved it. Beta actually published his solution of the lamp shift just a, or the same month when I arrived. So it was just an amazing piece of luck. So I was exactly there. And then a week later, a week after I arrived, I met Feynman, who was immediately I recognized as being a genius and a performer. He, he was both, I, I, I described him to my mother as half genius and half buffoon. <laughs> which was exactly correct. And, and uh, <laughs> all his life he was just entertaining people as well as producing ideas. And then at the end of his life he became really famous when he was a member of the Challenger accident mm. uh, uh, investigation team. And he wrote a dissenting report saying who's, uh, what, what really happened in the Challenger accident. And, it was, of course, a very wise move because his dissenting report 
got more attention than the official report. <laughs> By the way, somewhere you write that modern America <laughs> reminded you of Victorian England. That was true. I mean, uh, that was uh, 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 something I wrote in the first year that uh, I said that uh, Victorian England and America in the 1940s would have understood each other better than either uh, understands its contemporaries. <laughs> They were in a similar phase, both of them. <coughs> England in the Victorian era and America in the 1940s, at the, sorry, really at the top of their <coughs> climb to greatness. Also kind of a, an optimism, probably. What it was a very optimistic yes. time, both of them, and of course by America in, in the Victorian time and England in the post-war time were so deeply wounded societies. Freeman, on a lighter note, one thing which I find remarkable in your letters, and you just saw a short glimpse of it, how, man, how many children make appearances? Now, there are uh, famous physics names like uh, Dirac, Beta, but sometimes it's more the children that feature in the letters. That's true. I'm always interested in other people's children as well as my own. <laughs> 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 it's a great, uh, no, it's a wonderful thing to watch them grow and to, 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 to see how they can be f f fighting with their parents, especially if it's not yourself. <laughs> <laughs> One thing which is kind of interesting to, to witness during the, the book is your, uh, the various stages in your kind of intellectual evolution. You somehow you turn from a mathematician into a physicist into something of an engineer and I was struck that you somehow write that your real talent is perhaps not so much pure science as practical development. That's absolutely true, yes. Uh, I was, I mean, you the happiest... You feel yourself as a failed mathematician? Yes. <laughs> it was in a way, I mean, the happiest times of my life were working on, on nuclear reactors and on this, this nuclear spaceship, which, which never flew. But it was a time when we were working like engineers. We, 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 we got along very well. And we hadn't, didn't care who, who invented anything, we just all shared the pleasure of making things work. That's what engineers do. You, uh, out of your engineering, by the way, also, uh, there are some predictions about the future that uh, are, as you say yourself, are half true. I mean, there are parts where you describe space travel. Uh, I'm just quoting here about traveling to the moon. Once the first trip is made, there will be no end to it. It will become as commonplace as flying the Atlantic. Right. <laughs> That was conspicuously wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? No, that's the great thing about prediction that uh, it's Falsifiable. Al almost always fails. <laughs> 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 Nature has much more imagination than we have. Can I ask you to turn the, to the subject? Uh, there's a chapter that's called Truth and Reconciliation. And there is a certain threat during the letters, which is, uh, I would say, about peace, about armed negotiation. Can you say something about what we learned from that in your own development through the years? Yes, I was working for two years uh, after I was in Cambridge. I worked for two years for the Royal Air Force Bomber Command, which was engaged in killing Germans in large numbers, and mostly civilians. and. Uh, so this, this was a brutal campaign, and we did very badly. We never understood why our bombers were getting shot down. So, so we, technically, we were unsuccessful. It was a depressing time. So I had a, a, a picture of war. I was myself protected. I had a safe job. It was a government pol policy at that time. Scientists should be kept alive, and so I benefited from that. But I felt I had a very bad conscience and many of my young friends were getting killed. And of course, we were killing huge numbers of Germans. So I felt very strongly that 
the problem of war and peace was really the number one problem, that if we were to survive in the long run, we somehow had to deal with that. So all my life I've been heavily involved with problems of war and peace. I worked for a while in the disarmament agency in, in Washington uh, during the Kennedy administration, which was a very good time for... You had a few successes there, right? Yes, I mean, we yeah. did. Uh, the, uh, the real success is in getting rid of weapons uh, when you have a, a right-wing Republican president and he acts unilaterally. That's the way to do it. There are two conspicuous examples. R Richard Nixon got rid of all our biological weapons in one afternoon. And biological weapons were a really serious problem and there was, of course, the academic experts all were trying to conduct negotiations with the Russians and all kinds of international treaties and so on, which were chipping away at the problem, but never got anywhere seriously. And finally, Nixon decided he'd do it. And so unilaterally by his presidential decision, he abolished our entire program, got rid of the weapons, declass de declassified most of the details and it has been I would say the biggest act of real disarmament that we've done and the second one was by, by George Bush senior who, when the S Soviet Union still existed but was clearly showing signs of collapse George Bush did not try to negotiate or push legislation through Congress again he simply acted unilaterally and was one in one afternoon got rid of more than half of our nuclear weapons. Everything that belonged to the army was out. Everything that belonged to the surface navy was out. And those were, in my opinion, the most dangerous weapons because those, those were deployed all over the world in dangerous places, much more likely to get us into trouble than the weapons here at home. The, the weapons that remained, of course, are still dangerous. There are the, those belonging to, to the Air Force and those belonging to the submarine Navy. So those still, we still have to deal with those, but at least we got halfway. And my, my conclusion from this experience is that the way to get ahead with disarmament or with any kind of serious arms control is unilateral, that you do what you think is sensible and then wait for the other side to respond. Don't try and negotiate. Moving uh, on another topic, and we probably might get some questions about this, is uh, one chapter is called Adventures of a Psychiatric Nurse. <laughs> Explain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, just a, 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 a picture of how life really is for Institute faculty member, as a faculty member here, <laughs> as a professor here at the Institute, I was responsible for inviting young, young people to come as members and I invited a lot and I tried to, to take care of them and I always considered my job really was more taking care of the members than thinking deep thoughts myself. And unfortunately, of course, that doesn't always succeed. It's a, it's a tough situation for the young members. And I have, a, 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 it, it, it was worse in those days because they did not yet have Facebook and, and other technical aids keeping them in touch with their mothers and girlfriends. So they, were, they were much more alone, much more isolated then than they are today. So a young member would come to the Institute with a strong internal pressure. Now is my great chance, I have to do something great. And it's a terrible burden on some of them. They, if, if they're well-adjusted people and they already are good at making friends, it's no problem. You make friends and then you work together and you have a good time, that's, what, uh, that's what's, what's supposed to happen. Sometimes it happens that uh, somebody comes 
who has a hard time making friends, who comes from a different culture, from a remote country, and so it was with some of mine. So this, actually I had three casualties during my tenure, one, one suicide, two and ended up in mental institutions. Those were my, really my own fault. Those were people I invited here, I was responsible for them, and I failed. So I wrote a chapter about one of them who, uh, who was the one who killed himself, Taro Asano. Taro Asano was a brilliant young Japanese who came after having done a beautiful, brilliant piece of work in Japan. He came here and then got into a depression. And one day he got into his car and drove at 70 miles an hour up Springdale Road, hit direct collision with a big, fortunately, a big heavy car containing eight institute families, I mean eight members of institute families in the big car, Asano alone in the small car. So fortunately, the laws of physics say it's the one in the small car who gets killed and the eight in the big car got hurt, but not not, seri not, not seriously. They, they, they were taken care of. There's a very powerful passage where you travel with uh, the widow. Yes, so I, I took the widow back home to Japan, and she was completely hostile and, and shouting to everybody in, in both both in in Japanese and in Eng English, uh, that this Professor Dyson had killed her husband and was now planning to kill her. And so I had to sit there for 12 hours and listen to her tirades. But fortunate, I mean, the good news is that she recovered. She became, according to Japanese custom, after 40, 40, 49 days, you go back to being your maiden name and you're free to live as, a, as if you had not been married. There's, a, there's, there's no stigma to being a widow in the Japanese culture. So she did, in fact, she remarried and is now, as far as I know, flourishing. Pima, last question, then I'll open it up to the audience. Uh, you say something, you just said that, you know, it's that part of your success is just showing up, being there at the right time, at the right place. But it's remarkable, I mean, some sense reading this collection of letters, it had to remind me a little bit of the movie Forrest Gump, you know, you just yes. show up. <laughs> There's Freeman uh, in Moscow just after Stalin dies. <laughs> There's he in Washington just when Martin Luther King gave the speech at the Lincoln Memorial. <laughs> there you are advising Stanley Kubrick on the 2001 movie. It goes on and on and on. And, you know, your theory is pure chance, but I must say, as a scientist, I'm not really very convinced <laughs> about your theory. <laughs> Yeah, well, I never met Forrest Gump, but I'm proud to <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud to follow in his footsteps. And 